All right, um, and uh, one and two and three are on air, guys. So it's been recorded great. So I'm able to do that. So I'm going to just oh, hello, hello and um, and kick off for everyone's benefit. It's a it's a relatively small group, so hopefully we're gonna have some great good questions in the end. Uh, first, uh, thank you for inviting me, um, Abby, Precious, uh, uh, everyone who was um, in, initially in my contact. I'm happy to be here to talk to you. Uh, my name is Gene Gandal. I'm based out of New York City. I'm an organiza organizational design consultant, trainer, and coach. And I have been doing um, this line of work for uh, coming close to 15 years out of my 20 plus years of experience. I have traveled the world, um, although my hometown is New York City. I haven't been to Africa, unfortunately, not yet. Hopefully, sometime in the nearby future. Uh, this is, however, uh, the um, event specifically for your community and i'm happy to address some of the uh, potentially specific some of the specific questions you may have um i am going to share my screen at the moment just give me one second from current slide okay now you should be able to see the overview of large scale scrum less can you see it? could you please validate could you say just some briefly yes or no i want to make sure it's visible Yes, yes, we I can. can. Yes, I can Excellent. see it. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to keep rolling. So, um, not so much about me. Um, I don't never did well introducing myself <laughs> beyond what I already did. A 30 second elevator pitch was never a good thing for me. So, you, uh, you can pull me up on Google, you can uh, look me up on the internet. Uh, I have my own website that is full of uh resources and uh relevant data so you can always use it as a point of reference uh, in your self-study i am pretty easily accessible if you wish uh, my email is up there specifically on less front you got two more links here less.works is an incredible uh source of content on large scale scrum and i run the largest in the world uh meetup on large scale scrum uh, it's New York City less um, group. I also have my uh, free Slack channel. Um, I'm, I welcome you to join if you would like. Uh, relatively easy to get a hold of me with questions if need be. Um, I posted there some of my classes. Um, I'm not sure of how much interest you have at the moment. They are set in the Eastern Standard Time time zone. So depending how much appetite people have for maybe staying a little late. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to share the deck with you all. In fact, I will post it on the uh, on my website uh, along with the video, so everyone should have access again. Uh, so, a couple of words about less specifically about its history and the overall, you know, the the big picture. Um, so, first of all, large scale Scrum I consider this as like a body of knowledge that has um, core principles um, sitting in the very middle surrounded by frameworks sometimes referred to as uh, less rules uh, circumvented by guides and then uh, many many experiments we have 600 plus experiments documented in less uh, less um, has three books that go back to 2008 so although you may not have heard of less because it has zero marketing and zero promotion from the company uh, it has been around as the body of knowledge and as a way of working. So you have, hopefully you can segregate, separate between uh, a well-wrapped product or service that is well-presented and the one that actually has history and meaning and track record. So less is the latter. Uh, then the second book was written in 2010 and the only in 2016, we had the third book written by the co-founders of less, Craig Larman Basvori, uh, my colleague and friend from Seattle, in the states uh his name is michael james has this little uh snippet so the recommendation would be to read in this order if you wish to um to learn about less okay uh, just because the green book is a little easier to, uh, to digest now important to understand uh, and this is what um uh, many uh less experienced agile coaches and scrum masters do not stress enough to senior management Organizational structure is the first order factor that defines system dynamics, the ecosystem. Everything else just follows. Culture, mindset, behaviors, norms, values, processes, policies, all that stuff. Not unimportant, but not, a first, not of the primary 
a degree of importance. Of course, things like matrix velocities, OKRs, RAGs, maturity levels, they're much less important. We know of them, and many companies stress a lot these things, but that means they have um, been uh, overlooking, they have, uh, they have been omitting. They, it's a gross omission not to pay attention to the org structure. Now, it's interesting. I just looked this up a couple of days ago. There was a statistics out there. And of course, any company that puts out a survey, you may consider this as biased because they may, may perhaps they have sponsorship to do so. But check this out. It looks like the, the, the top key challenges uh, with adopting um, and scaling Agile are um, you know, organizational resistance to change and not enough leadership participation, right? It's funny. These are the biggest problems. And at the same, uh, on the same page, the same report says something else. Check this out. These two frameworks, well, in fact, the Scrum of Scrums is not even a framework. It's just a way to run meetings. I'm not sure why it's labeled at Scrum of Scrums. They have such an amazing percentage of success. So we just had the slide before that said, all oh, of this is the problem. And here we see these two having so much success. So the question comes, how miraculously did, did, did this happen? What exactly are they doing so special that it makes them so successful? And the, the simple formula I have derived is this, the degree of framework implementation success is inverse, inversely proportional to how it, it, the framework itself, challenges organizational design problems. So if you are a conformist and if you just you know, like changing superficially, pretty much changing nothing, improving nothing, then of course the degree of success is gonna be much higher for some time until whoever pays for these changes catches on that nothing has changed. Now, uh, this is the, the four laws of organizational behavior coming from Craig Larman, one of the co-founders of LESS. And of course you can read at, at your own pace um, and realize that the first and second or, uh, line management and status quo of uh, first degree of management has been always a resistor and always creates resistance to any meaningful changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why anything that has the, the word agile to it is often considered as a purist, theoretical, revolutionary religion, uh, and not pragmatic enough. We're being called dogmatic people. I've been called this many times. And nothing about me is dogmatic. Dogma is a great thing, but it's about pragmatism, first and foremost. But here's number five law that says clearly that fall, uh, culture follows structure. Okay. So we can concentrate on culture all we want, but if, unless we change the underlying structure, we may not see any meaningful results. Okay. Um, so let me move on to the next point I would like to make. Uh, in the case of significant changes, if you are just focusing on research and development, only on technology, your success of agile adoption is going to be extremely, extremely limited. In order to really make any uh, significant systemic changes, you have to look at different organizational areas as well legal practices, product management, HR policies, site strategies, etc. I call it a sushi roll. I'm not sure if you like sushi, if you eat sushi, but if you select sushi, you, you slice sushi, you get the full flavor only if you have all layers of it. Seaweed, rice, um, you know, cucumber, uh, carrots, fish. This is my way of referring to the org design because it actually is going to require those elements as well, okay? Now, um, for large-scale Scrum adoption to be successful, what we need up front is an informed consent of senior management, people that are in charge of organizational design and uh, in charge of certain organizational decisions that may be impacted by a large-scale Scrum adoption. Why? Because if you don't get enough senior management support or what we call just support and spirit or support in slogans and transparates where um, you know, management says, yes, 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 we are in supportive of this. Here is a, you know, a million dollars for you. Go ahead and figure out how to do it. That's not the kind of support you want. That's called su support in, in, in spirit. And uh, it's a one-time offer that they made to you by giving you money. Because once 
you, you know, you, they, they, they give away your budget for an agile transformation. And if there are no tangible, meaningful results, in a few years, someone's gonna catch up to it and says, well, it didn't work, it must be agile thing, right? So that's not what we want in, agile, in, in logical scrum adoption. We want support in, uh, in actual actions. We want what's called Gemba. Gemba in Japanese means uh, go and see where action is. So we want managers, uh, not in a bunker, but in a trench with, with the soldiers to see where action is and see how they can support. And this brings me to my next point. Uh, in large scale scrum, we have these three adoption principles deep and narrow as opposed to burn cello, um, top down and bottom up, and last but not least, uh, use volunteering. Keep, uh, deep and narrow as a burn cello implies that we approach this from two different uh, dimensions. We want to coach, train and coach individuals and teams as much as we can. And that's really from the bottom, but we also want to spend enough time to educate and teach senior management because the, the other ones, uh, they uh, make uh, shots, call shots uh, about organizational design and other things that are really, really critical for, uh, for business. Okay, and uh, top, bottom, bottom, up, that was it. So, they'll, and the last thing is use volunteering. We strongly recommend not to do any, um, let alone less, um, any agile, any, any or, or important or um, any improvement of significance organizational. We do not want to uh, do by mandate and by enforcement. This is going to significantly uh, diminish the, the intention and the purpose of it. We want everything done by volunteering. And we use volunteering concept at multiple levels. When we uh, choose a product group to change to less adoption, uh, when we uh, allow people to self-form into teams, so we use the, the concept of self-management and self-organization. So, and it's all by volunteering. So without forcing people into it, because by forcing you can probably ensure temporary compliance, but not commitment. Uh, and this graphic just illustrates my point that I made before. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is a typical example of so-called agile transformation where uh, what's being addressed are very superficial very uh, trivial elements of agile, uh, of organizational ecosystem, of organizational dynamics. Processes, tools, operating models, RAGs, reports, maturity metrics, velocities. These are things that we could look at, but not as a primary indicator of success. We really need to, start, so this is the left hand side is really broad and shallow. It's not uh, what we're doing less. Unless we do deep and narrow, uh, by looking at org structure, HR policies, vendor management, finance and budgeting. And of course, we meet it uh, halfway coming from the bottom, looking at team health and, long and, and longevity um, outcomes and other things that are very systemic. And of course, this is by volunteering. So this is senior management and this is the, these are the doers. These are developers and uh, you know, quality workers. And of course, I would argue that people that are in charge of superficial agile transformations are typically uh, first, second line managers, XPMI, people that are great cheerleaders, but are really not good at making any systemic impact for organizational changes. So we want this, not this. Now, this isn't about basic scrum. I'm sure, uh, basic scrum, I'm sure that majority of you understands what, uh, the, what, the, what are the merits of basic scrum. Just to remind in 20 seconds, perhaps no more than that, uh, it's the uh, very light framework that um, not a methodology and not the best practice of some sort. It's just a light framework. Uh, it has one product owner, one product backlog, uh, a lot of custom centricity in development. It's by a feature team that works on cross-cutting features. Cross-cutting meaning they cross, they cut across multiple components. Stable and long-lived, cross-functional and cross-component. And ultimately, in, in, in the tail end of this, we get what's called the potential shippable product increment. That's basic Scrum. That's a Scrum that is um, executed by a single team, three to nine people, uh, working on the same product for the same product owner. Scrum 101, just like it's written up in a Scrum guide. Now, large-scale Scrum is not, this is the key point, it's not copying and pasting 
one scrum team effort and just you know doing that copy paste copy paste copy paste this isn't scrum this is not less this is literally what's called copy paste scrum in fact if you have a bunch of different scrum teams that are working on completely different things uh, on distinctly different products there is no need to, pr to pretend and artificially staple them and say oh now we're scaling let them work on their own let them work for their individual customers uh, product owners um, and let it be do not try to scale what's not really scalable only scale if you have a wider product and you have really um, a good reason why you need multiple teams working on it um, here's another example of some of the scrum anti-patterns now here at the bottom you see probably healthy scrum right you recognize it uh, one team works across multiple components and delivers a potentially shippable product increment at the end of every sprint. Now here you see two anti-patterns of Scrum. Uh, and although this one, the one that's at the top, is relatively easy to um, relatively easy to spot because it's very mini waterfall. It's sequential analysis, design, and then a bunch of development, only then testing. This one is kind of hard to, you know, to an naked eye, someone who thinks uh, of a component as a feature-centric uh, line of work, they could be mistaken, and this is real Scrum. Oh, this is scaling, look at that. One, two, three, four, five teams uh, scrumming uh, concurrently, they're sprinting concurrently, and guess what? They're, they're not really scaling. Uh, they, this, by the way, this is fake Scrum because uh, they are sprinting around components, not features. But also, look at how much integration they need to get done in the end. <laughs> Um, they need to do, uh, you know, a bug fix and integration that will probably last at least a couple of sprints and will have a lot of fallout. So although you will get something in the tail end of it, the whole internal process is kind of fakish. And oftentimes we get this um, mistake by people thinking that if we have just a bunch of component teams uh, running side by side and, and scrumming, we are really uh, scaling. Not true, not true. Here is an example of something else that will probably strike you. This is an analogy. Well, first of all, let me say this. Many teams doing their own scrum, it's not less. Less is two to eight teams scrumming together on the same product. So if you're thinking in terms of this um, analogy, and maybe it's not the best analogy, a product owner is really not a jockey and, and the team is really not a horse. But think of it this way. If you've got six, or, you know, a bunch of uh, jockeys with a, um, uh, you know, with, with horses racing, uh, everyone um, for their own goal and purpose. This is really not scaling. Uh, you don't have the same vision, mission, purpose, strategy. You have a lot of competition. Now, this could be, on the other hand, very synonymous with less because you got X number of horses pulling in the same direction, same vision, mission, strategy, and the same person who sets it. Okay. So maybe that's a, an, something that you want to take away as an analogy. Um, less would be more synonymous with what's on the right, but not so much with what's on the left. Now, in, in terms of numbers, people always ask, so what's less? Can, can you draw boundaries around what less should look like? Um, well, first of all, less adoptions require months of preparation <clears throat> and then a flip. This months of, these months of preparations are not just a few days or a few hours. We're talking about a few months. In my experience, um, to, in order to prepare an organization to a flip and flip it to a less, it took me about two and a half months and more than once. So that I would recommend not minimizing, not trivializing this time period. <clears throat> Usually less adoption is around 70 plus minus a few people wide. Well, if you remember from basic Scrum, uh, uh, the recommended team size is three to nine people. Now, unless we recommend uh, no more than eight teams, so two to eight teams. And if you multiply the upper limit of nine by the upper limit of eight, you will end up with 72. So we're roughly, we're talking about the maximum number of developers that are involved in large scale scrum adoption is around 70. Now, it is very key to understand it's one product, one product owner, one backlog. No private team backlogs, no multiple product owners, um, no, no, no multiple. Uh, products. This is one product. If you have multiple products, obviously there's no need to scale. I am not managed mentioning anything on this Nota banner because this is about less huge, which is 
um, just for hundreds and hundreds of people involved. And once you understand less, hopefully if you um, choose to learn more about it, <clears throat> then understanding less huge would be even easier. Now, another on point here, um, look at this uh, spring cadence for up to, let's say we have four teams here, A, B, C, and D. Uh, spring cadence is such that you work concurrently. Uh, you start and you finish at the same time. It gives you a lot of opportunities for cross-coordination and integration that is not asynchronous, but rather synchronous, especially when it comes to planning. So these things um, are very um, much, much easier to do in less than in staggered um, anti-patternish scrum because you have uh, teams refining, uh, doing product backup refinement together, doing planning together and coordinating directly and not through um, you know, various uh, conduits or translation layers like managers or, or supervisors. They do it very, uh, very seamlessly, very directly uh, talking to one another. In order for this to obviously be possible, your sprints have to be parallel. They have, they cannot be staggered. Now, this is just another way to look at this. Uh, if you think of these five boats being rowed together by uh, different teams and each team could be a sli of slightly different size. There is no mandate that every team must be exactly the same size. Each team must have the, the needed skill set to get work done just like in Scrum, but it could vary in size. Uh, you have um, X number of Scrum Masters involved in less adoption and there are recommendations how many. Usually no more than three teams per Scrum Master and it's in large scale Scrum less. Uh, in, in large scale Scrum, a Scrum Master is a full-time role. It's not a weekend hobby. It's not a part-time thing because it's, uh, it requires a lot of organizational knowledge. Um, it's a team level coach. A Scrum Master is a team level coach in less. Uh, of course, you have only one product owner because this is, this is, this is Scrum, this is less. In, in Scrum, you don't have two product owners or more. Um, and you have some users that set the tone for clarifications. Um, whereas prioritization goes um, from the product owner onto teams, clarifications as much as possible go directly from, from stakeholders and users into teams. And all these bubbles, people yelling out for help and people offering help, that's what we typically expect. Uh, from, a, from, from, from large scale Scrum. This is what we see happening um, you know, between teams and between individuals and <clears throat> individuals involved. I, um, I like making cartoons. This is my hobby. Other than my pay job, I like making cartoons. I call it a Scrum blind date, right? So of course we see this a lot in, 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 in Scrum. And we certainly cannot tolerate this in Scrum, but it would be, it would be even worse if we saw this happening in less. We oftentimes see, uh, used to be a project manager now stepping up becoming a scrum master and used to be a business analyst stepping up and now becoming a product owner. Uh, oftentimes neither one of them uh, have uh, the, the necessary training or education or if, even if they did, the mindset and the behavior <clears throat> is really not conducive of scrum because the part of the org structure they belong to still treats them as their primary roles a project manager and a business analyst respectively, not as a scrum master or a product owner as, it meant, as it's meant to be in, in scrum. And of course, the team suffers. Uh, in large scale scrum, we strongly emphasize the importance of information flow. Whereas requests come directly from users uh, or customers, depending on whether it's internal or external development to our product owner and become prioritization and the, the only person who can set priorities uh, to a team is the product owner. While this is true, clarification as much as possible, if not all, goes directly from users and customers into teams. There are no middlemen, no interim layers, no one sits in between, okay? This is pretty important to understand because in, uh, in, uh, in many scenarios, in many cases, we've seen uh, many people sitting in between the process and playing the role of a proxy. Proxy of a proxy, a conduit, or, or other stuff, or other roles that are really not supportive or non-conducive of Scrum. Um, so here are some conditions for success, okay? <clears throat> First of all, I admire, and I would really, you know, wish you did the same. If an organization really changes the way it perceives uh, um, agile roles 
at HR level and improves the way HR database uh, is structured, not only in spirit, but actually the way they value and the way they prize individuals. Now, of course, this is another cartoon. If, I'm not sure if you read SQL here, but um, this is an example how a company typically would uh, update its HR database and uh, relabel an old role with a new role without really changing much. So in other words, if someone was a senior project manager on Friday, they will become a senior agile coach on Monday. If someone was a junior project manager on Friday, they will become a scrum master on Monday and the business analyst will be converted into a product owner. And it's usually done by looking at pay grades. Oh, this person is an XYZ pay grade. Well, we must be able to um, change their, their title. I mean, their role will be slightly different, but in the HR database, we're just gonna do like a little, a bit of mapping. This completely uh, diminishes the, the intention and the purpose, of course. It doesn't change organizational design or, the, or dynamics. It creates an illusion of a change. It's very superficial and very not, sustain, not sustainable. Now, we really don't want this to, to happen. And in large-scale Scrum, we look, I'll just use one role as an example. In large-scale Scrum, we consider a Scrum Master as a fully dedicated role. Consider this as a team level person, a team level coach, someone who has a lot of experience with Scrum, uh, strong understanding, at least theoretical and hopefully practical, with less adoption. Some someone like this will uh, probably be able to support up to three teams, no more. So it could be between one and three teams, depending on complexity of of, in, of internal dynamics, and also maybe it also depends on on the size of each team, maybe also depends on skills uh, and seasoning of that Scrum Master. But over time, the focus, the, uh, her focus or his focus will change. It will go from product owning teams, diminish that, never goes to zero really, just becomes smaller. And the focus on development practices and organization goes up. And this is why this is not a trivial role. This is not a, you know, um, a hobby of a junior person because once you focus on organizational design, you have been, you have been expected to know some uh, pretty important stuff, okay? Uh, moving on to this next point, I would like, so this is definitely something we want to stress the importance of a large scale scrum adoption. Take some of these roles very seriously and do not just overload or, or, or relabel existing roles with new roles. We don't want, and this is, this is actually right from less.work site. We don't want to see um, existing leftover people just being relabeled, relabeled overnight into scrum roles. And now uh, we expect them to act and operate as um, real scrum masters who, that understand scrum and agility. And in order for this not to be the problem, uh, the, this is really the question and also a recommendation for you with every respective organization I've been to. If there is no career path, if there is no recognition for a full-time Scrum Master, if he or she is, is, is being only treated as, oh, this is something everyone can do, can do, it completely defeats the purpose, okay? This role must be introduced in HR database, just like there is a project manager, a business analyst, Although in Scrum and Azure, we don't use these roles, but maybe a different part of the organization will still use them. So we want proper roles with proper incentives, with proper expectations, with good career path. If you're working in adaptive environment, if you're working in Agile environment, this is a necessity. Um, I wanted to stress something else um, that's pretty important. Um, I'm actually going to leverage also from MJ's, Michael James, there's a great comic book. Uh, you can actually download it from, uh, from the site. It's free. I have a bunch of hard copies in my home. I can't give it to you. <laughs> We're too far away, but uh, there was a free PDF uh, version available. And I would also strongly encourage you to play this video. It's going to be in the deck. That is a pretty uh, revealing about some of the dysfunctions and misconceptions of Scrum. Uh, for, for, uh, more specifically, and this is what we address in large-scale Scrum, uh, there is no such thing as a team output order. This is the uh, um, this this is an irony. This is a joke. People need to understand that team output order that says more, more, more uh, requesting from the team is most likely 
um, a fake person. That's why we strongly discourage teams to uh, align one product owner per team, one product owner per team, one product owner per team, because most likely these are not true product owners. These, um, um, you know, call them whatever you wish, business analysts, engineering managers, project managers, people just stepped into the role to fill in, fill in the gap. Uh, there's a great video and, um, out there on YouTube and I recommend you watching. The problem that it describes is also described here on this, um, on this slide where you see um, proxies and proxies of proxies and proxies of proxies of proxies. And finally, uh, you end up with some junior IBA that sits at the team that collects requirements and puts them in some uh, electronic tool of record. And now we're all very agile, okay? It's of course, that's an illusion, that's an irony behind. Uh, once again, I want to stress the importance that in large scale Scrum, uh, prioritization flows directly from, uh, from a product owner into teams where his clarification as much as possible goes from um, users and customers into teams. Now going back is for just for one second uh, to the uh, team outputs, uh, to, 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 uh, teams output owner uh, accountability. Obviously it is very hard. It is very hard to expect this person to be truly accountable for prioritization and strategy if he or she is not properly positioned organization. And since, uh, at least in my experience, it is almost impossible to, uh, to expect from a uh, you know, first level BA or even a senior BA to be a strategist or a visionary, putting this person into, uh, in, in charge of team output or maybe velocity or speed of delivery that completely defeats the purpose and intention of Scrum. So it may create an illusion, oh, we got the role covered, so why do we need to worry more? Uh, truth be told, this is not the right way to go. This is not the best way uh, to choose uh, an individual for the role. Uh, these people come from business, not from technology. These people are not just anyone with the title of a senior, uh, you know, senior lead, senior manager, senior BA. These people truly represent business. So the, if they come from uh, they either uh, external, man if, if for, for, for example, if you're doing an external product development, someone like this would be coming from a uh, product, man uh, product management background. If you do an internal product development, someone like this would be coming, someone, like, uh, someone for, this role, uh, for, for this role would be coming from maybe like a head of operations, a head of trading, or head of uh, HR, head of security, okay? Um, last but not least, I wanted to mention something about the team, the importance of having a properly structured team in large scale. Oh, there's a lot of background. So, Please remember something here, folks. Um, team, mature, team maturity level is very important, very critical in large-scale Scrum. Uh, for instance, at the, at the lowest level of maturity, we would expect managers to be setting uh, goals, to be, to be setting um, targets for teams. They would be execute, teams would be only executing tasks that were assigned to them by managers. <laughs> We can probably also see self-managed teams that are not yet able, able to self-design. Uh, and these folks would be probably be a little more mature, but still not mature enough. For large-scale Scrum success, we want to see uh, self-designed teams, teams that are able to design some themselves by volunteering. Remember the third principles, one of the third, uh, one, the third principle of uh, less adoption. Uh, and of course, at this level of maturity, self-designed teams are able to um, also set, um, you know, organizational context for themselves. So team maturity is important. And of course, uh, during this, the first few months of less adoption, when we go through this initial period of preparing our, uh, organizations, we do a lot of education and training, uh, physical, online, and we bring people up to par. Uh, we bring people up to par so they can become more mature and they can make these de de decisions on them for themselves. We don't give, uh, we don't tell people that they have to be assigned to given uh, to, to a given team. We give people a blueprint, organi organizational uh, blueprint, the team blueprint, and then we expect people to self-organize uh, into teams. And we go through um, certain motions. We we run a, before we flip the switch to become a less product group. We go through a, 
a self-organizing uh, team self-organizing workshop where people uh, have a chance to uh, self-form. Um, right. So that's that. And the last slide here, I would like before I open up to a QA, I would like to share this. Um, in large scale Scrum, just like in less, just like in Scrum, teams work on features. They do not work on components. Uh, let me rephrase that a little bit. Uh, teams deliver complete features. They do not, they do not deliver components. Uh, look, look at the left hand side. This is an example of a component team. A few component teams working concurrently. Even perhaps they work um, in a very uh, parallelized way. Um, very synchronous way. The start and finish at the same time. Remember that green slide I had before about fake scrum? Well, guess what? Each team can only touch one component. They cannot touch any other components. Team C, for example, uh, it can only work on component C. So it is a part of the system when you integrate it, but this is the only thing that they can do. So from a standpoint of a product owner, team C works on a very low priority item, item number four. They cannot touch anything else. And of course, you have a lot of integration, a lot of waste, a lot of overhead that follows. This is never a good thing because it's costly, it's timely, and it's error prone. Now, look at these three teams. They all touch any one of the components of the system, A, B, and C. So at any point in time, from a standpoint of a product owner, any of my teams is working on the highest priority item. And that's, by the way, ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, nothing special, but uh, being able to build, a cr having a cross-functional, multifaceted team. Hopefully, each team has also uh, full-stack developers or people that at least are T-shaped and have more than one skill set. But if this is not the level they have been um, able to reach, at least each team is autonomous and independent in, in, in its ability to deliver all three components. And this is much more bulletproof. This is much more sustainable because at any point in time, if, if, if Team Wu or if Team Shu falls ill to COVID virus or to whatever else problem, they maybe just take, take, they have to take off. The other two teams can work in the order of priority from a standpoint of a product owner without fear of, um, you know, falling into the trap of what's called local optimization, working only within the domain that is uh, convenient and um, and comfortable for them, okay? So that's really in a nutshell. I mean, of course, in order to learn large scale Scrum, and I wanna go back to the original statement I, I made, uh, you probably need to understand, well, first of all, let me step back. In order to understand less, you really need to understand Scrum. This is the key prerequisite we have for everyone who comes uh, into less training. In order to be able to um, use large scale Scrum organizationally, um, where a team is considered to be an organizational building block, you need some guidance and support from, um, from an experienced consultant who at least can take you through this journey for the, last, for the first few months before you get your feet wet and, and, and get up and running. But mostly uh, you need to have uh, right people identified internally who could, um, be supportive of the effort, who could be supportive of the, uh, of the process that you're trying to implement, the new process. And of course, it requires a lot of patience and sense of humor. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's a lot of information out there for self-study and self-education. Remember something, uh, large-scale Scrum is Scrum. It isn't Scrum that is hidden underneath uh, of many organizational layers of complexity and, you know, of ma management programs, projects, portfolios, none of that. Large scale Scrum is Scrum that is done in a complex product development environment where you have many people involved on the same product development. And that justifies justifies the, the name of it. It's large scale Scrum is Scrum. And of course, in order for someone to appreciate the value of large scale Scrum, uh, they need to also be cognizant and conscious that some organization, uh, organizational design dysfunctions that we know today would be addressed and hopefully re repaired, okay? So I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna stop. Uh, I know we have uh, 15 minutes left. I would like to budget for some questions if you have any. 
So anyone who would like to ask a question, just either ask it or unmute yourself and ask. Hi, good evening, Jim. Good evening, guys. Hello. Hi, my name is Igor Dalo. Um, my question is very basic. Um, in a nutshell, how will you differentiate scaled agile from let? Scaled agile as in? Yeah. Um, so let me, uh, I get this question a lot on Eldo. I use not to bother answering in detail because I felt like I was scolding or bashing something. Let me uh, share with you something. Um, I mean, there's so much to say. There's so much to say about this subject. So I'd rather just refer to something. So look, when we say uh, safe and less, it's like an apple and a tractor. These two things have absolutely nothing in common with one another. In fact, if you ask any Agile Manifesto co-signer or Scrum, Scrum co-creator or anyone who has been long enough in business, um, in, in product development business, in software development business, in Agile space, none of them will consider SAFE as an Agile method or mechanism or anything. It's an amazingly well-promoted, amazingly well-designed machine to generate a lot of revenue for the company that they put in place. I suggest reading this article, playing the video from the, um, actually it's the recording uh, version one uh, webinar a few years back by Dean Leffingall, Dean Leffingall himself. He says, we're not going to change organizational design. It's a pretty serious thing. We don't mess with that. And that's the premise of the mistakes because uh, without uh, addressing organizational design implications of, and problems, you can't really improve organizationally systemically. And if you don't want to take it from me, right. of course, it's a pretty long write-up. Uh, there's a huge library of reference, references that kind of tells you exactly what safe is and what it's not. And so you can take it from, um, you can take it from people that have been there, done this in Snowboard, Utah in 2001, people that read the Agile Manifesto. So it's really hard for me to say. Less is an amazing product. It's got every single keyword and every single facet that you can imagine. So if you ever forget about Agile terminology before you go out for an interview, just have safe, you know, diagram in front of you and you will be sure, you will be safe because every word that you need to know is there. It's a, it's a jambalaya, or it's a mumbo jumbo of terminology. And it has scrum in a very deep layer, it's in the basement. So I wouldn't even compare less um, and safe. I wouldn't even compare other like nexus of scrum and scale and safe, it has nothing to do uh, with, with uh, safe has nothing to do with agile. It's the, um, you know, it's a pretty, um, well, it's a pretty successful rub of the 21st century. That's what people sometimes refer to. Right. I'm not sure if that's the answer you were looking for, but at least this is what I feel and that's what many others do. Well, well it, it's quite interesting that you say, because um, this will give me uh, uh, some time to, to go look into it thoroughly, because um, you just blew my mind up. And um, I have a lot of research to do now, that's what it is. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate it. Hopefully I didn't blow it uh, in the wrong way. I, I just invite you to, um, exper uh, just you know, research in the area where it has very a lot of credible evidence. So there's a, there's a lot out there. Like imagine I'm, 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 I mentioned at the beginning, for instance, Les has zero promotion, zero marketing machine. I mean, er everything you hear about large scale Scrum, either you hear from a coach or from a from a trainer or for someone who has experimented with it. But you don't have right. uh, a, a marketing machine that promotes it. That's why everyone knows it. My next door neighbor has a pet who is certified and safe. That's how popular it is. It's popular in terms of <laughs> recognition, re recognition of a, of a, of a, of a uh, brand name. Okay. So, of course, what I'm displaying here, and I'm going to share this link with you as well. Uh, you can just... Yes, please. Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah.
Don't get me wrong, it's an amazing product. It sells well. It's like giving a, you know, it's like giving a painkiller to someone who is asking for help. Yeah, it will, it will kill your pain because it will make you, it's a, it's a, it's a doctor feel good approach. Maybe some companies need that. Hi, Jim. Hey, Mercy. Thank you so much for a brilliant session. Honestly, um, I'm really, what did the Godali say is blown away. More research for me as well, because I, I love to troubleshoot. I'll just say, just to add to what you said, honestly, we use scale where I work is a lot of, a lot of structures put in place. We never, most of the project were halted. That's the reality. So thank you for a brilliant yeah. session. Thank you. I mean, it was really not focused on safe. It was like on some of the facets of less, but I can tell you, we can talk about this implicitly. I don't necessarily have to use the term safe to um, expose some of the dysfunction that you will typically see with a heavy unpack and install successful installation. I mean, you basically change nothing. You relabel a lot of things. You take away autonomy and ownership from teams and you give it to managers on top of managers, but now they have the word agile into them. So of course that makes them very agile. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a perspective we need to develop and hopefully the, the bubble will burst at one point and people will start realizing that you're not really changing anything. You're just rearranging deck seats on Titanic, you know? <laughs> so, but, but sorry to come in again, but without, without proper marketing, Jim, mm. um, how do you intend to how do you how do you intend to spread this out if you're not marketing? Let's put it this way. Um, there is no centralized marketing by the less company, as far as I know, and I know the co-founders well enough to know that there is no, you know, there is no e-blasting, uh, there is no there is no explicit marketing uh, or bragging about grading of less. In fact, we don't expect less adoptions to be overly widespread because quite frankly not too many companies yet are willing to change for better maybe you need some sort of a cataclysmic event so companies start realizing that the old way of doing business is not is no longer feasible but it's probably also not fair if i say there's absolutely no attempt to increase awareness look my website uh, my uh, personal meetup and let me take you uh, let me share this page right has almost three thousand people and there are meetups around the globe and there are trainers. There's 21 of us around the globe and we try to do the best we can to increase awareness. We, like I spoke to about 20 of you, hopefully you will um, generate some appetite for learning. So this is, <laughs> this is hu the, uh, a, hu a human's best uh, unknown yet uh, maybe secret, right? <laughs> we all know where to find information. So I, I look at, promotion and marketing as we know it both with some degree of skepticism something that is great does not necessarily have to sell uh, to be sold it will sell itself i agree we need to increase awareness and recognition but it's not the same thing as shoving down the throat and saying hey this is the best thing because um i have certified a thousand people with the uh with the tech um safe um agile specialist now or whatever the term, the term they use it's not that kind of marketing. Hopefully it makes sense. All right, um, thank you, Jean. This is Carol. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, thank you so much. Um, I think you really broke it down and made it very simple to understand. I've been able to pick up a lot of points on what you said. Um, I knew a bit about less when I was doing my CSM certification, but this has expanded it a bit more. My question though is, um, does an organization, can an, an organization go and implement less as it were directly without having any background on Agile or Scrum? Can they just take less and just plug it and say, okay, they've done their research, less seems interesting and they want to implement can that happen without a background of scrum or agile already existing in that organization so carol it's a good question so I'll, i'm not patronizing i'm going to be honest uh to say that you're setting me up to to answer it in a way i would like to answer it well first of all i'm going to use the expression it's harder 
to unteach someone bad habits than to teach them from scratch. So I'd rather walk into the organization personally uh, that has no understanding of Agile whatsoever, or Scrum for that matter, than has a bad, uh, misperceived notion of the above. So it's easier to teach them from scratch than unteach them and uncoach them. Now, that being said, not being said, and of course, there's so much gross overloading of terminology out there. So many quasi coaches and, 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 and so called scrum masters there. In fact, I have uh, lots of publications written in that. That makes me popular and not so popular among certain people. But let me say uh, something else to your question. You absolutely don't just walk in and say, okay, we're going to do Scrum less tomorrow. And today we have a blank sheet of music. Um, for instance, me, when I walk in, uh, first I, just, I do an assessment. I need to um, meet people, understand what they are, where they, I need to meet them where they are, understand their goals, aspirations, intentions, work with senior management, as well as with individuals. And this could be a multi-step uh, process. And the whole pr uh, period of assessment could be just a couple of weeks, but the whole period of preparation before you flip the switch uh, may be a few months. In, in some instances, you don't need to scale. In fact, one of the strong messages we send always, try not to scale. See if you can do things in a simple way. If you can get away with four or five independent teams working on clearly independent products, go ahead and do that. Don't try to integrate it all together just for the sake of looking good on paper, okay? But first you need to understand what your product is, of course, what, the, what is it that they're working on? So there are things we need to prep and do up front. And of course you want to rely at least for some period of time, especially if you're in your organization to this, um, maybe on senior consulting support, I would strongly encourage you to bring a few um, individual uh, entrepreneurs consultants with credible industry reputation, as opposed to rely on expensive, cumbersome and large consultancies. I'm not gonna drop any names. But uh, here in the United States, in the UK, it's pretty popular for companies to uh, procure, to rely on large consultancies that come with thick PowerPoint decks and best practices and almost zero um, true success stories, lots of inflation. So always look for people that, you know, small companies, boutique firms, individuals uh, to lead you off initially. And then they will step back because the whole idea of a coach is to give you some initial support and maybe step back gradually so you can have autonomy back. There's no need to, uh, a real coach will not have as his ambition or her ambition to uh, conquer your organization and, and, and become, um, you know, um, an authority figure that will, you know, dictate or set the tone. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Gene. Thank you for the question, Carol. Um, I know we are coming to the end of the hour. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, anything else uh, you would like to ask folks? Um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I have another question, if, if no one um, is going to ask. Please do. Uh, hi, hi, Jim. This is Igor Dalu again. Uh, yes, what's the in less for uh, Sage Scrum Master? I'm sorry, uh, you broke up for a second. What's the what? What's the career path in less for Scrum Master? What's the career path? Oh, what I mean by career path. So first of all, uh, let's just put it this way. Uh, if you want to, <clears throat> so if you take Scrum seriously, let me step back. If you take agility seriously, agility, um, the word agile actually is a bad term because not too many people understand it. Substitute, substitute it with the word adaptive. If the meaning still remains, that means you got it right. If something got lost, you got it wrong. So if your organization is really serious about organizational adaptiveness, agility, and if they want to support agile roles, such as in Scrum, then what's important to understand that HR titles have to reflect that. You cannot take an old title, relabel with a new title, with the same old expectations and career path and uh, criteria for promotion and apply it to the new one. It could be a completely different thing. So a career path is really, first of all, defining the role as an official legal term. Then of course you want to offer this person 
an ability to learn and educate themselves from a credible resource, not from some internal uh, cookbook of best practices that was created by PMO. No. If a person needs to go out and get trained, he or she would need to go out and get trained. They need to get coached. They need to grow. And of course, uh, which is a bigger question, how do you decouple um, compensation and incentives uh, away from someone's ambition to uh, become promoted, promoted, and promoted? Everyone's, everyone wants and needs to get paid and fairly. But when you start coupling that with someone else's desire to control a big organizational structure, you end up with these career hoppers that want to become just managers on top of managers. And that's not the approach uh, that would be supportive of a Scrum Master career path. Because as a senior Scrum Master who is also a coach, a senior Scrum Master is a coach who can coach. Um, you may not necessarily be controlling or managing anyone. You shouldn't be really managing anyone as a Scrum Master. However, it shouldn't take away from your ability to grow organizationally, earn more money, and, uh, and become better. So think of it that way. So you have to learn. Your HR needs to know how to decouple those things. That's why HR needs to be educated as well. Hopefully that was uh, so. And I, again, I have a lot of re research and references on the subject. So feel free to reach out to me. Great. Um, folks, anything else? Shall we, um, or shall we just wrap? Uh, All right. So if there are no more questions, Jean, I just want to say a big thank you on behalf of everyone. We really appreciate your time. Um, as you've heard, some people, uh, it's additional information. But uh, the good thing is that we have been able to do kind of lay the foundation. And so I do know that uh, moving forward, a lot of people will now uh, try to understand what they need to do with regards to in the, uh, themselves as an individual or the organization. And this information tonight will help to make decisions moving forward with regards to taking the next steps, uh, doing uh, the uh, uh, taking the certification, the less certification with Gene. Our organization is in partnership with him. And so if you go on the Agile Advisor website, the TAA University, uh, also in the faculty, you'll find Gene there, his, his details and uh, all his upcoming classes you can register. When you click there, it takes you directly to his website and you can sign up for his classes. Uh, secondly, Jin is also uh, uh, available for our community. And so uh, through our partnership and agreement, uh, when we work with organizations, Jin will be providing uh, a certification plus um, a coaching session for organizations. Uh, and so there's a lot of work that's ahead of us and this is only just the beginning. So I just wanna thank you all for your time and looking forward to doing more work with you all and uh, Jean in the very, very near future. Sure, thank you, Abby. I thank you for mentioning this. Of course, my, my goal today was mainly just to increase your awareness, folks. And uh, I know usually when people come with questions or something like this, they leave, they leave even with more questions and that's totally normal. Uh, feel free to look me up, ask questions or just follow. There's a lot of free, uh, content free pro bono information like for instance there was a huge uh, repository of content here like the whole universe of learning unless unless that works site uh, and if you get lost with some of these uh, you know links and, and and references just ping me and I'll be able to uh, guide you in the right direction okay so with that, I thank you very much for having me here. I'll be again. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's take a quick selfie. I don't know if uh, Tunde can assist us with that, please. I actually did. I secretly. Oh, you did. did. <laughs> I, that's, that's what we look like. Um, hopefully, every. That's, oh. I, no, that's no I don't think the one they want to do. Everybody needs to turn their camera on. Because them. my camera has been oh. turned on, and in yeah. this, in this, in this I picture, agree. My I, my uh, camera was turned on. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I, I, that's why I was kind of comfortable when you see, I, I'm okay if you don't turn a camera, but this is so good if you do. Uh, let me so know. If you turn your camera on for one minute, I'll take the shot quickly. Everybody. Please, 
Jean, do you want so, to stop? So, can you, Tunde, can you please take the picture? Uh, Jean, you're welcome to take the picture as well. And yeah. uh, as many that want to turn on their cameras, please do. And uh, let's do this in a second and we wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It would be great if you turn your cameras on. We'll just take a quick snapshot of this. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do it once again. One second. One second. I have three screens here. Okay. I took mine. So <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully I got it. Well, again, thank you all. It's, it's been a pleasure, Abby. I'm going to stop recording now and it's, uh, go in the chat and I'll share with you the, the link, okay? All right. Thanks, Gene. Right, Take thank care. You. Thanks, Bye. Gene. Enjoy the rest Thanks, of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.